We hear the parables today in the, in the gospel from Mark. And if we were to take the two main words or sayings from these parables, I would say it would be kingdom of God and seeds. But what does this mean and why is Jesus using these two images or sayings? What exactly is Mark referring to in the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of God for Mark is, is and Jesus and, and Mark's gospel is the experienced authority and reign of God that was at the center of Jesus' preaching. The kingdom is already present. So this is not something that's going to happen, but it's already present in the person of Jesus himself. It grows mysteriously in the church. I love that saying. It grows mysteriously in the church. It will be fully consummated at his coming and glory at the end of time. So it grows mysteriously. And that's where the word seed is going to come in so importantly in Mark's gospel as well. We have these two parables and they both refer to the seeds. And the first, well, the second part of the parable, Jesus, of course, referenced the kingdom of God compared to a mustard seed. And anyone listening at this time is going to go, whoa, 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 the kingdom of God is a mustard seed? This doesn't make sense. And that's the point for Jesus always. He's saying it shouldn't make sense. You see, what the Israelites were waiting for at this time for the kingdom of God to come is they were expecting a great army to appear and say, here is the Lord and Savior. Maybe an earthquake announcing the presence of of the Lord and Savior. But instead, Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And he uses hyperbole here. He says it's the smallest of all seeds. That's not actually the case, but a mustard seed is very small. And he goes on to say it's it's the largest of all plants. We know that's not true either. But it makes a great image for people that they would understand. Something so small can grow into something so mighty that the birds of the air can rest in it. And right there, by the way, should call to mind our first reading of Ezekiel. Now in Ezekiel, this makes sense. The Lord says, I'll take from the shoot of the cedar and I'll plant it by itself so the Air, the birds of the air can dwell in it. And what this refers to, by the way, and Jesus is part of the parable as well, is saying it's not just for the chosen ones anymore. The kingdom of God is for all. Birds of all kind to dwell in this plant of the mustard and dwelling there. But it starts off small and it grows. And of course, we see that with the universal church as well. We see that with Jesus' is preaching in the beginning how small it started and how big it is now. But it's mysteriously grown. And how does it grow? And this is where the first part of the parable comes in as well. This is where Jesus uses the image of once again a seed scattered. And he states, the farmer does not know how. It is through it all, through it all the seed would sprout and grow. He knows not how. Of its own accord, the land yields fruit. So what is this referring to? What exactly does this mean? Well, it's essentially what Jesus is saying here is we don't know exactly how everything works, but if we let the seed be scattered, it will work. It will grow. We could say that this is how we could put it. We cooperate, but we cannot control or hasten the arrival of the kingdom by our efforts. This is what Jesus is trying to say here. So often we try to make our will part of God's will in the sense that we try to control God, right? We say, well, if I do this, then God, you're going to do this, and I know you are. That's not how we're called to do it. And the same with the kingdom of God. We cannot hasten the arrival of the completion of the kingdom of God. St. Paul knew this principle well, by the way. In In 1 Corinthians, he states, I planted, Apollos watered, But God causes the growth. God causes the growth. Therefore, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who causes the growth. And this is the case not only in the kingdom of God, but this is the case in all that we do. Because God wants to be part of all that we do. And he wants to be the one in control. And he's saying, let me work through you. And how do we do this, by the way? We surrender everything 
to him. And when we do this, miraculous things happen. It all kind of seems to fall in place. You know, recently I've experienced this principle with, uh, with, with our church and this sense of, of construction. You know, I know last year we started talking about, about renovation and, and over and over again people are saying to me, Father, you know, construction is not an easy task. I'm like, ah, no big deal. It can't be that hard. I was wrong. That's for sure. Construction, even if you want to remodel a bathroom, is a big deal. Imagine trying to renovate a church. And so these last six or seven months, what I've had to do, and and we as a committee have had to do as well, is surrender to God. And they got to the point about a month ago where, imagine this in construction, everything's kind of falling apart. And when this happened, God took control. And in the last month, everything's kind of coming back together. What happened a month ago, by the way, is our, our architect that we had decided not to be our architect anymore. And at that point, I remember going and praying, and I went and prayed in the rectory, and a great confidence came over. A great confidence of the Lord saying, God saying, I got this. How beautiful. God saying, I got this. And it was just this freedom of saying, I surrender to God. And from that, we've hired a new architect, The architect is doing great work. They're putting plans together much quicker than we ever thought that was possible. And it's amazing what's going to happen. It's it's great. With this, by the way, a little update on on the church renovation, I have good news. The end date is still the same. We still plan on finishing before Advent. They know that has to happen. Now, the other part of the good news is because our, our architect quit, our start time is pushed back as well. You may say, well, now, why is this good news? It means we get to stay in the church longer before we move in the gathering place. And they've all assured us we have plenty of time to get the renovation done in between, you know, August and and the end of November. So we surrender to God. And once again, it's not only in church projects we're called to do this, but in our own life as well. So often when everything seems to be falling apart is when it all comes together because we're finally letting go. We're letting the Lord do what he wills. We get out of the way and let God's will be done. In order for this to happen, by the way, we have to take that saying that St. Paul has to his second letter of Corinthians as saying what? We walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. This takes courage to do. And this is what St. Paul is saying as well. We are always courageous. We are courageous walking forward in faith, not by sight. And surrendering everything to God. Be it an issue with our family, be it an issue at work, in a relationship, whatever it may be. We say, Lord, I give it to you. And he works. He works mysteriously. It's in the book that I've referenced often, Into Your Hands, Father, by Father Wilford Stenson, which is available, by the way, as an audio book on Formed. Or, of course, you can, you can purchase it as well. I think it's $12, because that's how expensive this book is. But it's an amazing book. It's in this one that there's a section of saying, let God act. And it's all about total surrender. It states, we hinder God when we do not want to respond to his total surrender with our total surrender. You see, God gave a total surrender to us in giving of himself. And he's saying, I will provide for you. But when we don't totally surrender everything over to him, we're hindering him. The total surrender implies that we lay the entire responsibility upon God. We give him our understanding so that he will use it to think what he wills. We give him our will for his divine will to be incarnated, so that he may will through our human will. We give him our memory for him to touch it and make it remember what he considers important. We place ourselves and all of our powers at his disposal. We say to God, you can bear the responsibility now. And he is happy, because this is what he has desired all along. We call God a good father. 
as we celebrate Father's Day this weekend. We know that God is a good Father, and He will provide for us. He will take care of us. And all He wants us to do is lay everything before Him and let His will be done. Even if we can't see it always, He always has a plan, and His will is always better than ours. And He says, give it to me, and I will take care of the rest.